All right, welcome back, guys. This is our second panel. And if you're joining us for the first time now, my name is Andy. I'm one of the Sanford faculty. And now we're going to focus on entrepreneurship. So we talked about entrepreneurship. And now I feel like entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship are two are different sides of the same innovation coin. And let's find out how the engine of entrepreneurship is transforming emergency medicine. And we are so lucky to have four heavy hitters of industry, as well as practicing clinicians. And so without further ado, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Evan Berg, who is an emergency physician, but also he is the chief of emergency medicine for Medically Home, which is a startup that provides safe uh, hospital level care at the home. And prior to this, he was the vice chair of clinical operations at Boston Medical Center. And he is passionate about increasing access to acute care for all patients. We also have Dr. Yannick Boilu. Uh, he is a CARS intensivist at the University of Montreal. He's also a serial entrepreneur, three startups, including Reacts, which was acquired by uh, Philips in 2020. That's a virtual collaboration platform. And he's currently the, the uh, medical officer for Philips Ultrasound. We also have uh, Diku Mandavia, who is the associate professor, a professor at USC LA County. He's also a self-described tech guy stuck in an ER doc's body, and he's a serial CMO, currently the CMO of Brainscope, which is a startup that detects brain bleeds and concussions at the point of care. And last but not least, we have Dr. Yiding Yu, who is an emergency physician at the Boston VA. She's also a serial entrepreneur, former founder and CEO of Twiage, and currently both the chief product officer and the chief medical officer of Olive, which is a revenue cycle and intelligence startup. So with that, let's just jump right in, guys. My first question, this is an entrepreneurship panel, so I have to ask, what critical unmet need does your company or startup address, and how does that get us closer to EM 3.0, which we defined as a precision emergency medicine and tech-enabled acute care, both inside and beyond the ED? Why don't we start with Evan? Sure. Um, thank you for, uh, for having me, Andy. It's nice to be here. Um, so... I, I ended up uh, joining Medically Home largely because coming into my third decade of, of practice of emergency medicine, I saw the challenges with uh, access for, for patients who were having decompensation in their chronic medical conditions. And so it really came from a, a place of um, experience working in the hospital system and, and wondering if those changes could be brought about uh, from outside of uh, the hospital. And that's really what motivated me to move into the space of entrepreneurship. And then why don't we move on to Yannick? Yeah, thank you, uh, Andy. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, great to be with the panel. So uh, in my case, uh, you know, both for the critical care needs and emergency medicine needs, uh, back 20 years ago when uh, the ultrasound other than the fast exam in the ER, uh, there was a lot of interest and need for you know doing a focused cardiac exam, knowing more about the pleural space, the procedure guidance for vascular access, um, and the problem was that you know people wanted to have their hands on, they wanted to practice, they wanted to learn, and the resources to provide that were not always easy to 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 find, and this is why I started initially by putting together. Uh, a curriculum that was, you know, helping out with uh, e-learning and on-site training, and then uh, created and, and patented the simulator because people wanted to see pathologies, learn more, tra practice transesophageal exam, even for focused exam. And then a couple of years later in 2012, the need was, hey, I want to have uh, an eye in the sky. I want to have, you know, your opinion on the case. I want to practice for maintaining my competence. And then there was not always a time for a trainer to go on site or for people to go meet the trainer so this is when I said, hey, why don't we have a, a virtual interactive need in order to bring this kind of tele-ultrasound guidance? Uh, so this is where the, the, the innovation came from, really, for the need, from the needs and try to execute to simplify it for the users. Yeah, and I'm so glad we have point-of-care ultrasound as mainstream in the ED. How about yourself, Diku? Well, you know, point-of-care ultrasound is something I'm quite familiar. I know Yannick from years back. We're good friends. You know... My journey into sort of technology was all about solving a problem. So I came to study emergency medicine in Los Angeles at LA County Hospital in the early 90s at the height of the gang ep uh, epidemic. And at that time, uh, the CT scanner was on the third floor and three football fields away. Uh, it was a very frustrating uh, time. A lot of patients died in our 
sea booth area. We didn't know which body cavity to open. It was it, we were flying blind basically. And at that time, ultrasound was a size of a, a kitchen fridge. Uh, a, a, and somebody at that time said, "Hey, we got this small one. You should take a look at this thing." And they brought in a device the size of a dishwasher. I said, "Wow, this thing. We could use this this dishwasher size." And you know, th- this was starting to happen across the country and. And you know Yannick was part of that journey, but now look at us today, right? Um, and that took a journey. And you now I'm doing something, you know, again, very disruptive now. Again, a point of care diagnostic at brain scope, being able to rule out a bleed uh, 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 with a handheld device and, and grade concussion, which is industry first. You know, so now already real world evidence, we're able to uh, decrease 40 to 60% of CTs in patients that are GCS 15. That translates into less radiation, less cost, uh, ultimately much uh, better care, decreased length of stay. So I think it, the similar story is all of us are trying to solve a problem here. Yeah, as I ho- re- hold my Lumify in the ED, I can't imagine that it was once the size of a refrigerator. That's, that's pretty remarkable. And also, eating. how about yourself? Yeah, you know, I think about in my career, it's always been about improving access to care. Um, And so, you know, my first startup was uh, in the pre-hospital space and getting patients from an ambulance to a hospital effectively, ensuring that EKGs, videos of strokes, you know, photos of traumas could be set in so that, and, and GPS tracked so that a trauma team in the ED or the clinicians in the ED could know exactly when a patient would arrive and have the details about a person instead of just a Jane Doe or a John Doe coming in with a, with a STEMI. Um, And now at Olive, as you mentioned, we're a revenue cycle and uh, automation company. And so um, it means when I think about it, it's like all the work that happens that has to happen behind the scenes to ensure that when a patient does come from care, that care is compensated for and paid for. And so the things that we do is like automating eligibility checks or finding insurances. It sounds really silly, but it's actually one of the most the biggest applications are often in the emergency department. We have patients who come in, they might not have their wallet. They might not know what coverage that they have. In fact, especially for some of our most needy patients, they have multiple coverages. It might be they actually have Medicaid coverage, um, uh, but they didn't know that they had it. Um, And so uh, for a health system, right, um, uh, margin uh, drives mission, right? So um, you have to be able to say like, well, are you going to balance bill this patient because they're a cash pay patient and they're going to get this massive multi-thousand dollar bill for this ED visit, or are you able to find that they have coverage from another insurance? And so you can actually get reimbursed instead of putting that on. And so for a lot of our customers who are large health systems, they view this as not only you know helping their financial health in a very challenging system, environment for healthcare right now and reimbursement, but also, you know, being that um, at solving solutions and providing solutions so that patients don't have to take the brunt of the financial impact of this care. Um, and it's gone worse because, you know, over the, the last 10 years, the rise of high deductible plans has increased by 60%. And so there's way far more patients under high deductible plans. And so they are taking on the bulk of especially unscheduled uh, care like ED visits or hospitalizations that can often have a very large financial impact. Yeah, and eating, you really highlight the complexity of ED care. And I love Yannick and Diku, you mentioned the power of portable devices. And I'm really excited to hear about how that could be used, uh, Evan, in the home. So the, the, con- the concept of ED in home is fascinating to me. What does that look like? Yeah, so uh, ED in home came from uh, a place of seeing patients who uh, live with various medical complexities uh, in their life who have exacerbations of illness. And I uh, one time mapped out kind of the number of satellites that typically uh, orbit a patient who is in a uh, complex care coordination program. And and you just saw these patients repeatedly uh, come to the emergency department when they were having exacerbations on all ends of the acuity spectrum. And a lot of that is because the system just broke down. And ultimately, when the patient was having an exacerbation, a concern, uh, they were uh, going to a place that was readily available and and really, in many ways, was 
incredibly patient centric in terms of access points. Um, of course, with overcrowding and capacity issues, uh, we know that the emergency department isn't always the most patient centric place uh, for patients to receive care. And it results in uh, 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 admissions to hospital and then other uh, other things uh, take place uh, thereafter. So the concept was, could we offer that access to these patients who are medically complex at baseline, who are having exacerbation, and can we essentially bring that same level of access to the patient's home? Um, uh, that requires a lot of um, a lot of build because what we're doing is we're completely disaggregating the benefits of that. Um, uh, um, centralized process. And so with it, it's how do we create entry points that are uh, accessible to the patient, accessible to the referring clinician. And then with that, how do you create a platform that can encompass all the things that we take for granted working in a brick and mortar ED? Th those include things around electronic health records, uh, data exchange um, uh, between the patient's longitudinal record, uh, and then, of course, the care that's being delivered in the home, in this case by the MIH clinician, the, the upskilled EMS professional, um, we refer to them as a primary and home clinician in this model. Um, how do we make sure that they are tethered in such a way that that uh, dyad relationship between the in-home clinician and the board-certified emergency physician outside the home is uh, seamless in a way that takes place in the brick and mortar uh, setting. And, and with that, all of the point of care uh, device exchange that's being referenced, ultrasound being one thing, analyzers being another thing, how do you have that exchange of information? So yeah. um, that is the concept of the model uh, uh, in brief. That's a very fascinating care delivery model. And as I talk to you, I, I really wonder, how did you guys get to where you are now? And I say that because we just had a panel on entrepreneurship and the synergy between entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship as well. But at a certain, a certain point, some faculty members or some doctors made the plunge and became entrepreneurs. And so what, at what point, what inflection point made you guys make that plunge? And also, why choose entrepreneurship over entrepreneurship? Now, this is open to anyone. Maybe if I can start, uh, in my case, uh, my father was an entrepreneur. Uh, anyway, he had nothing to do with medicine. He was in construction and welding and things that but so I, I guess I had an entrepreneurial fiber hidden somewhere and when I was confronted with such a need you know initially when I uh, was starting my critical care fellowship and I had a portable device that was uh, provided to me by the department and you know every patient I was scanning I was like wow you know everyone needs to to learn this so then I saw that there was such a demand I said okay you know big demand there's a lot now and there will be a lot in the next 20 years and it still is the case today so I said, you know, uh, opportunity meets uh, the, 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 the knowledge, uh, the, the, the willpower to, to make it happen. So I think then this uh, entrepreneurship fiber that I had was just con combined with that great need and all of the opportunities that were uh, ahead. Uh, so this is how, in my case, you know, this uh, and then you just get it's, it's you know, it's, a, it's a, almost a disease. Uh, when you get uh, touched by this, uh, you get hit by this entrepreneurship, it's, it's so much fun to invent something, create it, have a, a response, getting it better, then you know, become an expert in the field as you're creating things while you're practicing and, and developing the field. So that has been uh, uh, my kind of uh, combination of, of the medical and entrepreneur component for the last uh, 20 years. Yeah, if it's a disease, that's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm in your voice. So I, I'd like to <laughs> experience that as well. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I can jump into. I, I I I became an entrepreneur pretty early in my life. I started my first company in residency, but I um, up until that point, um, I had wanted to be a tenure track uh, health services researcher. So I mean, as, you, as I think all of us uh, remember, right? Medical training is incredibly prescriptive prescriptive. You take these tests, you have to go through, you get matched, um, and I was like, and especially if you want to go into academics, it is a you know, get your you know. K, get your R1, like there is like a path. And um, and I was trained on the path, I had mentors on the path. And um, and I, I knew I wanted to do something related to innovation. Like that's how I view health services. I wanted to study what it worked, what could make systems better, not just an individual patient better. Um, and then, uh, but then I was also really interested in, in innovation. So I actually really struggled with, um, 
how to marry my desire to to innovate and create change with creating what I mean literally for 20 years had been my dream of like having a career like you know being a triple quadruple whatever that threat is in in medicine um, and living that career and so I, I for quite a while in my early career I tried to like really saddle and see and kept my academic appointment really tried to figure out is there a way to grow and the good news I think for folks who are in that stage of your career um, is that many organizations many innovative health systems and, and academic medical centers are more more open to a path like it used to be very clear-cut like are you publishing uh, or are you doing something? And now there's more work and more recognition for entrepreneurs and innovators who are doing something, but maybe less traditional on the academic path. I actually served as chief innovation engineer um, for a large $2 billion health system um, out of residency. So that was my first job. And so the job title was to be kind of an entrepreneur and innovation uh, person within a health system. And um, this was back in, oh my gosh, 2015. And um, we were launching telemedicine and we weren't even like the first health system in our region to launch telemedicine. Um, but to doing so was, um, was a absolutely mission driven, but also was incredibly slow. Like I, I think I spent most of my time dealing with red tape so that my team could get the job done. And on the other hand, I was running a startup uh, part-time on the side. And um, when I raised uh, um, capital for that startup, I had to take a step down and like do the, my part of a startup full-time. And um, you get the bug that Yannick describes, this ability to speed, the ability to see conceptually from an idea that you like thought of and then build it into reality and out in front and helping doctors and patients. Um, and that really that endorphin hit and that dopamine hit is just so, um, so incredible that I realized I really, that's how I wanted to, to drive my career. And, and I realized that, you know, I can always be a clinician. I still practice today. Um, but you know, I had to leave my, I'm going to be a tenure track researcher behind. I, at some point you have to make a decision and it worked for me. Um, but I think, you know, having kind of evolved in parts across the path, I know there's many different avenues to do this. Uh, obviously, I'm a full time entrepreneur now. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's I think if you crave the speed, if you crave the flexibility, the, um, and there's a little bit of risk, right? You have to take on that risk when you're going as an entrepreneur. There's uh, the paycheck might not be as stable, you know, uh, than, than what you do today. Um, but it, it is an amazing experience uh, to be able to see your vision uh, to reality. You know, one thing I'm going to add here, you know, I think we'll all agree that medicine and emergency medicine include is stuck in convention. And you, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people on this watching this broadcast that are young residents or they're in academics. And there's this notion that, you know, academics is a location, right, that you are leaving, quote, academics. I feel that academics is really a state of mind. And, you know, I've seen a lot of great academic work done by people that aren't actually at an academic institution. And I would argue that the people on this panel, I know there's lots of other good examples that are doing that. So the advice is don't necessarily listen to the tenured professor who only knows a conventional pathway. I think there can be a lot of interesting, whether academics or whether it's innovation that can be done, quote, outside the, the classic ivory tower. Yeah, Andy, I, um, I know this, uh, this talk is called Physician Entrepreneurs. Um, I, I don't really think of myself as, as an entrepreneur. I, I really landed where I was because um, I was focused on trying to address an issue of, uh, uh, of uh, crowding and, and problems with uh, a point of access. Uh, and I was finding that for various reasons, being um, because there's uh, right now uh, misalignment in, in the systems, um, that it was difficult to bring about uh, that change. Um, and so it really was an opportunity to, um, to think about a problem, how you can address from a different lens. And I, I guess if that is uh, if that is what uh, the theme is here, I think trying to address uh, something that you're passionate about from a different lens 
can be accomplished um, uh, within a, a healthcare system, can be accomplished certainly outside of it. Um, I think it, it probably uh, having a feet in both worlds makes you the most effective. I mean, I still practice uh, in, a, uh, in one of our local academic medical centers. And um, it's, um, uh, it's definitely uh, grounding to do uh, ongoing clinical work and it very much refocuses um, efforts uh, as we're trying to, I think, innovate and um, uh, build some solutions. Yeah, I think this rich discussion is a perfect segue to the next question actually, is I think now more than ever, there is a lot of excitement among emergency doctors to try their hand in startups and in industry, especially with med tech and AI and digital health and such. And I wonder, is the grass really greener? Because the startup life is hard. And I would love to hear from you, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, please uh, give us an example of one of your highest highs and also one of your lowest lows in, as a physician entrepreneur. And this is open to anyone. Well, I can, I can start. Um, highs, highs. Oh, I think there's like, there's like two points I can think of. One is like that, that moment that we, I think we've talked about, which like you had an idea and the first time you see it out, right. That there's like this moment, it's like, you're like, Oh, uh, my baby is out there. I think that is an incredibly high, but then you immediately have the, Oh my gosh, but it will ever work. And will I get funding? So, so that, that's a short lived one. I think, I think my, my actually, like really air celebration was uh, our last company got acquired for 60 X revenue. And uh, it was just like an amazing success an amazing team coming together. And um, you know, that, that kind of sustaining validation, that was amazing. And, you know, probably like where the glamor right of, of, uh, of an entrepreneur comes from, but I would also say, my gosh, I mean, there's when I think back on it, um, you know, I feel like I have many PTSD from some of the early, you know, uh, founding uh, times. Uh, and one that I, I will mention is one of my early, uh, early uh, companies, um, we had, uh, we were growing, we were, our product was out there, uh, we were delivering more features, it was getting more complex, and we were having more and more bugs with our releases. Um, I was not a software engineer. I was like trying to figure out what can we do um, and what was going on. And I had, you know, hired a CTO and, you know, we're trying to work on it and things were just not getting better. And, um, and uh, it broke down to the point where I had to um, fire uh, uh, my uh, chief technology officer. Um, and I fired him without any backup. There was not a deputy. There was not uh, a person weighing the wings. I mean, I took control of our AWS. I like revoked all permissions. I mean, like for a period of time, that was all that was holding it together. Like I was just like, I hope nothing breaks, like that nothing happens. And I, I mean, this was just like crazy. I, I was like, I think the whole house is on fire right now. And I had to go out and find a new technology leader who we found and was an absolutely amazing and turned it all around. But I need to be straight with a person to say, this is what happened. We're in a dire situation. You're not going to have any pass off, by the way. There's like not a person who can onboard you into our tech stack because uh, I had to let him go. Um, and I need you to turn this engineering team around um, because I, it's just not, not been working. And thank goodness I found the right person who like took the company in an entirely different trajectory. But mm. We could have bombed in that moment, um, and we were lucky to to slip by by the skin of our teeth. And I, I was like, I just did not sleep that week, um, and so it was it was crazy. And and it's something that you 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 can't go public about until like years later, right? Like, what am I going to say to my customers that I, you know, like you you are so it could be so lonely in times like this where you're like, who has ever dealt with this? Like, do do any of my physician friends have ever dealt with this situation? Um, and it's sometimes, you know, you need this network of entrepreneurs and or people who have been through, you know, when, uh, uh, you know, and you start using expletives to describe what's going on. But this is really one of those moments. Um, and yes, yes, it, you have to be you have to be facing it and you have to brace for those moments. That is a powerful story. Just hearing you, I'm, I'm sweating and I'm glad that you guys overcame that situation. Does anyone else have uh, examples to share? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say some of my, some of the, the highest is, um, 
when you're able to take care of a 80 year old patient who's um, having a shortness of breath and um, uh, is surrounded by family and you're able to keep that patient in their home uh, with the family intact, I mean, that, that just, that just makes it all worth it. So that kind of experience, I mean, the other two roles that um, uh, have really resonated with me is just seeing the burnout of both emergency physicians as well as our pre-hospital providers um, and, and seeing them pivot in a, uh, in a model where uh, they're finding the joy of uh, practicing medicine and reconnecting with patients um, that, that definitely has been uh, a high. I think the challenge is, is I'm very much uh, come from a, a, a clinical operational. And I think the realities of um, how do you pay for these services? Um, how do you ensure uh, that the technology can support uh, this kind of decentralized care in a scalable way? And, and, and that reality uh, to get from uh, pilot to scale is is a is a big challenge because at the end of the day the clinical delivery system uh, is there. You have you have you know physicians and nurses and and pre hospital providers who are hungry and eager uh, and and want to jump in um, and the training to get them to that point to deliver the care model is a very much uh, scalable. It's some of these other elements that are lagging a little bit and I think are the, the challenge that I found in, in my uh, journey. Hmm. One of the things I'll tell you that's been very satisfying is the ability to scale, right? So when I was full-time academics, of course I was teaching ultrasound and it was in a <clears throat> confined academic center. Of course, I was teaching uh, nationally and internationally, but there's only so much I could do, right, as an individual. But by being part of a company and having an organization, you can impact change. And I've seen that happen. And now, when it can all sound, is literally worldwide. And, and that's really satisfying. And so for those people that are listening, you can do the things you love and you'll be able to do it at a different scale. Yeah, I fully agree with Diku. And in fact, a uh, very similar experience in my case of, you know, being involved since the beginning at the bedside, on site with people to train people, and then eventually, you know, building up the momentum, teaming up with the company and having worldwide impact and seeing all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, articles, the doctors at our borders that were using, you know, the both the virtual platform and tele ultrasound for all kinds of setups and people in South America and you see a bunch of things and you're like, wow, I was able to have an impact into this uh, uh, scaling of clinical, uh, the fetal maternal medicine problems, which are very uh, important in Africa and other places in which you can contribute to, to better care of patients. I think that was a, a big uh, a big high. And in our case, uh, in fact, one of the, it wasn't a low, but it was a stress is when COVID hit because uh, we had you know, thousands of users and we had a scaling plan and everything was you know, going well. And then from one day to the next, uh, you have tens of thousands of demands for you know, the virtual platform to get activated for way more demands that you have planned in the growing. Uh, so even though we had you know, already uh, scaled uh, to a point where it would, it would uh, be able to, to accommodate way more than we had in terms of customer, uh, we had to say, yeah, yeah, sure, let's do it. But at the same time, you're you're taking the business in, and you know that the servers will be stressed. And you know, it's a uh, just uh, we we know technologically that it would it, it would it would be okay. But there's quite a, a stress when you see the number of users ramp up, and I wanted to make sure that it was not like crashing from one day to the next. So that was um, it was kind of a potentially low in the becoming that didn't happen. Uh, but that was a scary part. So it goes again with the scalable part that Diku was talking about. There's a great part to it, but there's a lot of work to be able to get there. Yeah, it's very exciting. You know, instead of taking care of one patient at a time, to see that your work is impacting tens to tens of thousands, maybe millions of people in a given hour, that's, you know, that's really exciting. And the way you describe it, certainly being a doctor is like a superpower. But I think there's also some unique challenges as well. And one question that I, I'm really interested in 
is that as a doctor, we have certain values, right? We are very, very indebted. We, uh, we are very uh, passionate and we care deeply about our patients. Um, but as an entrepreneur, we have a lot of stakeholders. We have our VC firms, our investors, our board, our CEO even. And let's say if you were a CMO, how do you, how do you navigate the waters if they want you to act in a way or make a decision that you feel like is personally not in the best interests of your patients, your users? Uh, how would you navigate that situation? And do you have a, an example that you can share where you did so? This is open to anyone. You know, I'll tell you, I think it's your responsibility as the chief medical officer to provide that proper medical guidance in, in the same fashion that you would manage your own patient in your own facility. That's really important. And, and you can't compromise on that. And there's been some high profile companies such as Theranos and, and, and companies like that, that have unfortunately tainted um, some of the good innovation that is out there. But uh, at least in my books, uh, you never uh, stray from that. That is your, uh, your, your sort of uh, guiding principles. Yeah, in my case, what I found is, you know, when um, I was speaking with, you know, the investors, the board, the VCs, uh, sometimes, uh, they were uh, questioning some of the, okay, why are you going to do this? Why don't you do that? Because this will bring more revenue. But, mm. you know, I never had any problem, uh, not just, you know, boldly telling them because this is what I think is good, just explaining to them, showing them why it should be that path, showing them how, you know, the, the steps would, yeah, it would be a bit more expensive to get there, but that was the right way. And, you know, maybe I, I uh, was lucky to have uh, uh, a great uh, board and investors, but they were always able to say, okay, now that we get why, we know the why, and we, we are confident in the team and where you're going because we, we understand and see it. And But there were times where they were like, hey, why don't you do this? Because, you know, especially time to revenue and all of that, but we never had the, you know, when we started uh, back in 2015, um, uh, when Philips approached uh, myself and my company to say, hey, you're creating this, you know, virtual collaboration platform. We have this handheld Lumify. Why don't we incorporate your software in our device? So we'll be able to, to put together the device and the remote collaboration platform. So it took three years of work, combined work before we released to market. So I had to convince my board of putting a team of uh, 10, 15 people working almost full time uh, at our expense before launching and then have revenue. But because they saw, wow, this will have a, it's an opportunity for scaling, for better care and they were right into it. So I think it really, we have a lot of challenges, but if you take the time to explain the why and how you're gonna get there, you have high chances that they will follow you. Yeah, I think you know, Diku and Yannick really nailed it. I think that you know, it depends on your obviously position in, in a company is um, if you if you're not uh, in the in the in the founder seat right where you brought on the investors and so you're a, maybe a chief medical officer and you're more of an employee I think you absolutely do right as a physician have to uh, be true and speak because if it's not you nobody else will that's your your responsibility and it's possible, right? We all know this. It's possible that you're you realize that your company and the business leaders in your company just aren't don't like what the, you have to say, right? You're going to say the truth, and they don't like it. And and if they are just you know intractable and will not listen, and you feel like now you're you're breaking an ethical barrier, then that is a decision where you know I think many clinicians will leave, and and that is the right thing probably to do, right? Because if you cannot stand by and you think you're 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 doing harm um, or like you know cutting corners and you're basically asked to sign off on things, right? especially if you're in medical devices or anything else. Like this could be really challenging. And there there has been situations where the clinicians in a company have felt incredibly pressured uh, to just do right by the business. Um, so those can be absolutely challenging, but I think you have to stay to your ethical standards. Um, on the other hand, if you're a, a founder and you have the ability to say you know. Uh, you have an opportunity to select who you want on your board and who are you going to be your investors. Now, if you're a first time entrepreneur, oftentimes you're like, I'm anybody who's going to give me money. Like you go, you, you're, you, you're not going to be a chooser. Um, but if you get a choice, uh, choose wisely. Like if you, and especially it's easier, like a second time you get folks, definitely culture values matter. Um, and, uh, 
and understanding, you know, what your goals are and where you want to go and what those investors want um, does matter, right? It's, I've talked to entrepreneurs who want to grow a company more organically. Um, and you know what? That is okay. If you are the founder and you want to grow a company more organically and you want to maintain control, there are wonderful companies that are almost entirely owned by one single person. Um, but clearly, and if you're gonna if you're gonna bring an investor to this who wants to exit in a time frame, who wants to make their investment back in time frame, you're gonna clash. And so if you're gonna raise capital, you wanna be really clear about the type of business you wanna build and then find the best alignment with investors um, who kind of kind of meld in that vision. You're not gonna be 100% aligned at times, but you need to be close. And, and then when you're close, then I think Yannick's you know, advice, which is like, get to the root, get to the cause, get to the bigger picture, right? The, the vision of where you guys wanna to get to, you know, if you're aligned on the, hey, this is like the success that we both wanna to get to, then they can oftentimes, they, they trust you, they invested in you for a reason, y your expertise, is, is why they put money in. So they, you know, I, I don't think that you, I actually feel that boards very much defer to uh, the executives of the company. Um, this idea of like some evil board that like, you know, constantly pulls strings or something is actually not uh, the norm. Uh, in fact, it's very, very rare. And you see it in like activist investors and public companies, but the vast majority of investors are probably more hands-off than they are hands-on. They have some opinions, but at the end of the day, like you run the company and you will make the decisions and 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 they will give you their feedback for it. Yeah, I, I have nothing uh, to add to what's already been said. I, I do think, um, you know, the responsibility we have as a as as a physician um, uh, is uh, is critical, and I think um, it's important to be a part of a organization um, that um, that supports um, you know that stance. And and I think if you don't feel that there's alignment, then it, then you should be having a separate set of discussions. Yeah, I love how for all of you, you know, medicine is really that guiding light. Right, that that um, north star that you all follow, and another question I have that I think uh, is related is how is entrepreneurship viewed in academia? You know, you were all currently or, or once in, deeply involved in academic medical centers, and I'm curious: is it viewed positively or negatively, or, or maybe it's neutral? And how does that perception uh, and attitude impact innovation in our field? It's open to anyone. This is where I think we're stuck in a lot of convention, and I'm hopeful that conferences like this will break out of us out of that convention. I think you and I had this conversation. You know, I believe if you don't have any conflicts of interest, you're probably not doing anything interesting. And um, that would, you know, I'm sure a lot of, uh, you know, academic physicians that are senior would shudder at that thought. But the reality is for us to really make these changes, you're talking about emergency medicine 3.0, we, the emergency physicians, need to be involved, right? And that will be working and partnering with technology companies to do a lot of great things. And we've seen great work like that happen. And we just went through the pandemic, you know, once in a hopefully a lifetime thing for us. Uh, and some of the greatest innovations uh, like the mRNA vaccines, guess what? They wouldn't have happened unless there were physicians working with BioNTech and Moderna. So I thank those physicians. And, and so we shouldn't see conflicts of interest as, as problematic, but rather, um, you know, sign that they're, they are exploring new uh, technologies, therapeutics, et cetera. But again, this is, at least in my perspective, been a bias and, and, and we really need to break through it. And I'm, like, I'm hopeful we can. I feel that um, it's, it's uh, less of a problem now than it was uh, 20 years ago when I started my first uh, company, probably because of COVID and a lot of other things. But um, exactly as Deku mentioned, you know, I always tell people, um, you know, if, uh, if we're not involved in creating those uh, momentum and, and innovations, um, they will, you know, people will complain that, oh, why is this platform coming out? It's not adapted, there are bugs, the, the, the workflow and the user interface is not, you know, familiar. It, it, 
probably because no users were involved in creating it. So I think that if we want to have those products that really fit well with, with what the needs are, we need to be involved. And I think this is getting more and more accepted, both by the academia, the universities, and our colleagues. And honestly, on my end, because I've always kept you know, practicing and, and trying to interact with the colleagues and see, do you like that? Let's try this. They viewed it as, wow, this is bringing positive energy, bringing you know, positive uh, um, uh, new products, innovations. And I think it's our role as innovators to, to, to as DQ was mentioning, break sometimes the silos between academia and innovation, but I feel it's uh, progressing and going in the right direction. Hey, I'm sorry to butt in. I'm going to be a taskmaster here. We're running short on time, and so we really would like to get some audience questions in. Uh, so we'll shift to that. Oh, fantastic. Our first question, yes, for our audience members, ask those hard questions. Our panelists are excited to field them on. In the early stage of your startup journey, when money is tight, how did you navigate the high opportunity costs you're missing out on from your clinical jobs? Uh, I will answer this. Um, I think it's tough no matter what. And I was somewhat lucky in that my first time I had to do this, I was not that far from residency. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm just going to live the residency lifestyle for a little bit longer. Um, I think I paid myself 70K a year um, in my startup job as CEO, um, which is Again, an upgrade from my residency salary, but not that much. And I moonlighted. So, you know, I, I augmented it by working half day a week uh, in your urgent care or, or doing an evening shift. Um, not the same as having a full clinical salary or, or kind of where you are. Um, but especially if you're in the early, like in this one, the early stage, if you join a later stage company, you should generally be paid much closer to market rate or if not market rate. Um, but in the early stage, Startups just don't have the capital, and especially if it's your startup, right? Like I was like, I want to put as much money towards my engineers and hiring that team than to pay my salary. Just that like, you know, $2 million doesn't go very far if you start paying everybody market rate salaries. Um, and so we had to kind of make that balance um, and uh, see what works. And, and really Moonlighting will have a lot of entrepreneurs uh, make it work. My advice to physicians that are thinking of working in industry is take a little a dip in, right? You can do some consulting, some advisory work uh, that would be part-time, 10, 20%, et cetera. So you can sort of scale your way in. It's unlikely that you're going to go from full-time emergency medicine to completely a full-time role with a, say, equivalent salary. But there is a pathway there. All right, so for the next question, for younger professionals interested in entrepreneurship, would you recommend working clinically or administratively within a health system or a company before st starting a standalone company? In my case, uh, I would say, uh, in fact, I don't think there's a magic recipe because uh, if you feel you have you know, the energy and the, the, the basic fiber of the, the entrepreneurship, I think what's most important is to be well surrounded. Uh, you don't want to think you're going to be doing it all on your end, on, on your on your own. It's not easy at first because money is tight, and you know to hire the lawyers and the financial folks and technology folks is not easy. But uh, I don't think you need to necessarily go through a formal administrative uh, path. You can just uh, jump in, and as Diku was mentioning, you don't quit from one day to the next, but you just start doing it on your own. And if if it you know the scaling of that can go quickly, but so I think uh, either path can work well. I, you know, I, I would say that there is value to understanding uh, the system and where the systems are functioning well and not functioning well uh, to gain perspective and understand the problem you're trying to solve. If you have that clarity early on in your career, um, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I personally needed time to get that uh, point of clarity. So I think it, it does depend on what problem you're looking to solve and, and who you are as an individual. All right, here's another question. Can you speak to the conflicts of interest IP transfer when you all moved from your, your original jobs to your private startups and companies? So this can be really tricky. I will say that I did start a, my first company, uh, venture back company in, in residency. And um, I was 
uh, lucky in that my residency, which is an in internal medicine, is uh, was had like very limited overlap right to what I was doing pre hospital med- pre hospital medicine emergency medicine uh, startup. And so, and especially as a resident, so for those of you who are residents, um, your employment status with a with your health system is much more of a, like a trainee, right, as opposed to a full on employee. And so, there is more wiggle room. And so, uh, when I left the Brigham, uh, and I had conversations with Brigham, I disclosed to the Brigham, um, but we basically discussed that Brigham owned zero percent of the company, and I did not use. Brigham resources or hospital resource or hospital time to build this company. You kind of have to keep that documentation and the use of resources very far. Um, this is hard to do if you have a lab or you need to use resources at your health system. And so then you have to negotiate this. But I would say, um, you know, talk to folks, you know, get counsel on it and negotiate. Uh, they will always slap you with like the standard agreement, which, uh, you know, this is like, it feels very outdated and, and crazy when you look at it and you're like looking at a startup, but you can negotiate. Um, so especially from a resident perspective, you definitely have leverage and uh, don't be afraid uh, to go and, and use that leverage. It might be a little different if you are full-time faculty and at your work spins out directly from your funded research. All right, let's see if there's any more questions. I have one fun one. Oh, I think this is actually our cue. Uh, but I just want to take this time actually to thank all our panelists. You guys. I'm just going to ask one more question, though. Sorry, Andy. Oh, please. It's all about to your current state. How much of it do you think you would attribute to preparation and your skill versus just blind luck and being in the right place at the right time? You know, uh, they say that uh, luck, in fact, is a mix of uh, hard work and opportunity. <clears throat> so uh, I think timing is everything, but it doesn't come with just the opportunity or just the hard work. So I think it's really a combination of the two meeting together. And I, I think it's a matter of surrounding yourself with people who know a lot more than you do. Um, I think, you know, I'm fortunate in my company to be surrounded by uh, uh, product and business and payer who, um, uh, I don't, uh, that those aren't my areas of expertise and it really is a, a team approach, uh, to, to, you know, get something towards the finish line. Surround yourself with, uh, you're, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? So spend time with people who are giving you a higher average. That's right. hundred Mar- percent. Marry up, marry up. Marry up. I mean, just being part of this panel, I feel like I'm getting smarter. So that's fantastic. Uh, And I want to also say thank you to our panelists. Your words of wisdom, super helpful. And we wish you only the best for your current and future ventures. May you have many unicorns, market dominance, sky high valuations. And thank you also for our audience. We have a lot more fun in store for you, including some very exciting uh, demos from from cutting edge companies. Back to you, Dan and Jason.